Today I'm going to show you what's inside of a car engine and how it works to power your car. And we're going to be taking apart this Nissan 3.5 liter V6 engine out of my Infiniti G35. Now the main job of the engine is to take air which flows through the upper manifold here and fuel which flows through the fuel rail here and turn it into rotational motion which can be used by the transmission. Now that rotational motion is outputted at the back of the engine here by turning this shaft which turns the flex plate or the flywheel depending on which transmission you have. Now there's five main layers to an internal combustion engine. At the top here we have the valve cover and then we have the cylinder head which houses the valves and the spark plugs then we have the engine block itself which houses the pistons and the cylinders at the bottom here we have the crankshaft which is inside of the crankcase and finally near the bottom here we have the oil pan I'm gonna start here by removing the fuel rail here and the upper manifold now each cylinder has its own individual air intake port here that takes the air fuel ratio down into the cylinder. Taking a step back here you can see that the air fuel will move into the middle here into each individual cylinder head and then exhaust out either side. At the side of the cylinder head here you can see where the exhaust gases will exit out after combustion. Now on the top of the engine here we have the ignition coils which has a spark plug underneath. Now the front of the engine has two main compartments. The enclosed compartment here is the timing chain assembly and the external compartment here are all of these accessories. Now they're all driven off of the crank pulley over here which is the same shaft that runs to the other side of the engine to power the transmission. Some of the accessories include this AC compressor over here which has its own belt and tensioner. We have the fan, the alternator and the power steering pump which runs off of its own belt and tensioner over here. So I'm going to start tearing into this engine here by removing all of the accessory belts and the hoses. This here is the AC compressor. We have this belt tensioner here that we need to release in order to get this off. And we can remove this tensioner here and then remove the AC belt and then I can remove this AC compressor. In order to remove the belt on this side, I need to loosen up this tensioner over here. And then I should have enough slack to release the belt. And then I'll just remove this idler pulley here. Now this here is the alternator, which is powered off by the crank here. Off. This here is the power steering pump. It's also driven off by the crank pulley over here. And remove the pump. I remove the fan assembly here and this pulley. Next up, I'm going to remove this 19 millimeter crank bolt. Well, I'm lucky this thing's actually pretty loose. This thing's got a lot of play. Next up, I'll just go ahead and remove the brackets for all of these accessories. So now that all the accessories are removed, I'm going to go ahead and remove what's left of the cooling system. Then I'm going to remove the thermostat housing here. And then I can remove this hose on the left side of the engine. Back of the block here, I'm going to remove this hot coolant hose here. This here is one of the variable timing control solenoids for the VVTI system. And then I'll just remove the solenoid. And now I'm going to remove the rear coolant hose here. It should slide right off. So here's what the engine looks like with the cooling system and the front end accessories removed. Next I'm going to remove the engine mounts. Now we all know the basics of how an internal combustion engine works. Essentially we have an air fuel mixture that comes in past the air intake over here and fills up this combustion chamber. When the spark plug ignites, the crank slider mechanism of this piston crank assembly will push down and this offset here will create a torque on the crankshaft causing it to rotate. On the pistons upstroke, the exhaust gases are exhausted out through these valves here and into the manifold. Now this is the timing cover assembly here. It's where the crankshaft will drive the two camshafts. Now it's a completely sealed system because it has to be well lubricated. So I'm going to start by removing all the 10 millimeter bolts that go around here so we can pop the cover off to see what's inside. So here we've got all the 10 millimeter bolts removed from the front half of the engine here. Now what's great with these covers is you can service the timing chain gears as well as the tensioner and the water pump without removing the timing cover. Now this here is the ignition coil. This one came out a little bit oily. Now as much as this engine is actually easy to work on, there's two bolts that hold this timing cover inside the oil pan here. Whoa! And that's why you don't open the valve covers before taking off the timing chain cover. Now on the bottom of the engine here we have this oil pan which contains all of the engine oil that's needed to lubricate this engine. We just lift off the oil pan there. And inside of the engine sump here we have the oil pickup tube and its screen and that's responsible for picking up any of the oil in the sump and cycling it through the system through this oil pump over here. We've also got the dipstick over here that sticks down to read your level. And we've got the two 12 millimeter bolts that hold the front timing cover on at the front here. And then remove that oil pickup tube. Now I'm going to turn the engine back over. Look at all that mess. Now I'm going to remove the timing cover. So here we've got the timing cover removed here. We have the crankshaft at the bottom here that drives this timing chain, which also drives these two large gears at the top here, which are the intake variable valve timing gears. The exhaust gears for each head are located behind here, and those are driven by secondary chains behind the main chain. There's also the main chain tensioner over here that has this guide. 
and there are secondary tensioners in and behind here for the smaller chains and then we have the water pump. Now the entire system here as you can see is very filled with oil and that's to lubricate the chain and all the moving parts inside of here. Now the crankshaft only rotates in the clockwise direction and you'll notice that it's geared such that every two rotations of the crankshaft equal one rotation of the intake gear here. Now the engine has a timing system to allow the valves to open and close at the correct time. So for example, as this piston is moving down, we want air to be drawn into the cylinder, which means that this valve must be open at that time in order to allow air fuel mixture to come in. So in order to correctly time these valves, a timing chain is implemented to link the crankshaft to the camshaft. The intake camshafts themselves are variable in terms of their angle and they can change their phase relative to the crankshaft in order to optimize fuel economy and reduce emissions. Now this here is the valve cover and it covers the valves and the camshafts as well as the top part of the engine head here. Now this here is the variable valve timing solenoid that controls the variable valve timing gear on the timing side here. I'm just going to remove the solenoid here and just lift up the valve cover here and remove it off of the engine. Now the valve cover is not only responsible for sealing the top half of the engine with this gasket here, but it also provides a little bit of ventilation to the crankcase which has built up pressure from the pistons moving up and down to vent back into the intake through these tubes over here. We also got the spark plug tube seals here which prevent oil from going down into the spark plugs and getting burned. Now unlike the olden days, this is made of some kind of composite or plastic material. So here with the cylinder cover removed, you can see the two camshafts. This one being the intake camshaft here, which controls the air and fuel mixtures that go inside of the engine here. And we have the exhaust camshaft over here, which controls the timing of the release of the exhaust gases on this side of the engine. Now I'm going to demonstrate how this works here as I rotate the engine. You can see as the cam slowly starts to push down on that valve tap there, and then as I completely turn this here over you can see that it returns back up to the top here through spring pressure here's a shot of the timing gear and how the camshafts all work together now in order to continue disassembling this engine here we need to remove the camshafts but removing the camshafts require removing the timing gear as well as the camshaft gear cap over here and the timing cover and remove the tensioner this is actually a hydraulic tensioner now I'm going to remove this top guide here for the timing chain and now with this chain slack, I should have enough slack to remove it from all the gears. I'm just going to use an 8mm hex here to remove this chain guide. Let's remove this crank bolt. Try to break this guy loose here. And then slide off the gears and pull off this side here with the gear. Now in order to remove this timing cover, we have to remove a bunch of 10 millimeter bolts that bolt it to the block and the head. Now this here is the water pump. It's driven by the timing chain assembly and it provides fluid flow to cool the system with coolant. And now I'm just going to continue removing all the 10 millimeter bolts on this timing chain cover. There we go. Now this here is the camshaft bearing cap. It's responsible for distributing oil throughout the camshafts for lubrication as well as the VVTI system to feed that variable gear. Just a couple of 10 millimeter bolts to remove. And I can remove this bearing cap here. Now underneath this bearing cap was a spring here and that's responsible to push this timing tensioner against the chain. Just remove this bearing cap assembly here. So here we have the intake and exhaust cams over here. It's now held in only by these three bearing caps for each shaft. And this is the bearing cap itself. And I'm going to lift off the exhaust cam here and then lift this intake cam off. This here is the camshaft sensor. It basically is like a hollow fax sensor that picks up the position of this camshaft using these notches here. The sensor will send a signal to the ECU so it knows how to adjust the variable valve timing on the intake side. Now inside of the engine head here we have these hex head bolts and that's responsible for bolting this head to the engine block. Now they're on there pretty tight because they actually have to hold the compression of the engine. Oh man, and there's 16 like this. Now that these are broken free, I'm just going to remove them. And now that all the head bolts are out, I'm just going to lift off the engine head. And I'm going to lift off this engine head here. This here is the head gasket, and it's responsible for holding compression between the head itself and the block during combustion. And if I remove the head gasket, you can see that there's actually a cooling jacket that goes all the way around here. So when they say you have a busted head gasket, that means this gasket here is allowing the oil from these oil passages to leak over with the coolant. A blown head gasket also will mean that one of these cylinders are going to lose compression. Now each piston itself is actually timed by its position on the crankshaft down below and you can watch as they move up and down here. So that's pretty much it from the top end disassembly. I'm going to rotate the engine now so we can work on the bottom. So here we have the upper oil pan or the crankcase and it's held on all around by 12 millimeter bolts. There's also two more 12 millimeter bolts inside of the sump itself here. And then we can pop this off and have a look at the crankshaft. Ah! Case. 
This here is the oil pan baffle. I'm just going to remove all of its 10 millimeter bolts. Here you can see the oil hole where it goes from the crankcase into the engine block itself. And here's the one that comes out of the oil pump and goes into the crankcase to the oil filter. We have the oil pump itself located over here and it's driven off of this crankshaft. I'm just going to remove these 10 millimeter bolts and hold it on. There we go. So this here is just a bearing holder. It kind of reinforces where all of the bearings are located in the block. Now these are an external Torx E14 socket. Okay, next time don't use sockets that are not rated for impact. This one literally just exploded on the third bolt. All right, I got me a fresh socket and I'm just gonna break this loose with a breaker bar. So with the main bearing holder bolts loose, I'm next gonna turn to the connecting rod cap bolts here. And these here house the bearings for the connecting rod where it connects to this crankshaft. These are a 10 millimeter, 12 point socket. So I'm just gonna put my breaker bar on there and break these loose. Now if you look closely, you'll see that these are actually out of plane with this one being 60 degrees away from this one. And that's just because this is a V6 engine with one bank of cylinders this way and the other bank of cylinders over here. Now if you look at the top here, cylinders one, three, five, two, four, and one with cylinder one here being a top dead center. We also have cylinder six here that is also a top dead center. And the rest of them are various other stages in their combustion cycle. And this is done in an offset manner to reduce vibrations. Not all of the cylinders are firing at the same time. Now this offset is controlled controlled by the firing order of the engine as well as the position of these connecting rods on the crankshaft down below. Now I can remove the main bearing holder here. I can just remove this bearing from the engine here. Now this here is the main bearing and that supports the crankshaft over here. It's got a bearing surface on the inside here that's very well finished and that rides up against this smooth surface finish here of the crankshaft. Now what's interesting is this is the only bearing out of the four to include these side thrust bearings here. So I'm next going to remove the bearing caps for the connecting rods and then I can remove this bearing cap here. So this here is the connecting rod bearing surface here and its corresponding bearing. Now with the connecting rod disconnected here from the bearing I can actually push the piston down. I'm going to use my brother's toothbrush to remove this piston on this side here. Just push it down. And I got the piston out. Now this here is the piston and arguably it's the heart of the engine. It's responsible for moving up and down as the combustion occurs and pushes it to turn the crankshaft around and around. Now the top here where combustion occurs, we have two compression rings here that prevents any of that combustion from going down into the crankcase. Now we also have this oil control ring over here and as the piston is moving down it wipes up any of that excess oil on the cylinder walls preventing oil from entering the combustion chamber being burned. Now underneath the piston here we have this brisk pin here and that's really free and very well lubricated to move. And you can see with all of the pistons removed how the crankshaft rotates about the main bearings here. Now the back of the engine this crankshaft here is going to bolt up to the flex plate or the flywheel before being sent out to the transmission to power the wheels and it's called the rear main seal. Now the rear main seal is usually very difficult to service when it leaks because you're going to typically have a lot of oil pulling up between the engine and the transmission but the entire engine or transmission has to be removed in order to service the seal. And that's the seal removed. So I'm just going to use my brother's old underwear here to wipe off any excessive oil on this crankshaft here. Ew! Use this! Oh, thanks. Quick shout out to Gunk here for sending me these new wipes to try out on this engine here. So I'm just going to take one of these wipes here and wipe up any of this engine oil all over this block here so it doesn't drip on my dad's driveway. It's not that absorbent compared to my brother's underwear though. So far it's working pretty good. So with the seal and the bearings gone from the crankshaft, I can now remove it from the block. It's really heavy. So here we have a good look inside of the engine block here and you can clearly see as how the pistons themselves are a little bit offset from each other. Now the bottom half of this engine here including the crankcase is only cooled and lubricated by oil only. Now if I flip this block over here we can have a closer look at the head part. You can see that there is actually a cooling jacket that goes around each piston over here and that's what cools the combustion chamber at the top of the engine. We've also got the knock sensor at the top here. Now looking at the cylinder walls here, you can see they're actually in still pretty good shape. You can still see the cross hatching. Since this is an aluminum block, you can see that there's the cylinder liners here cast into the aluminum. Now it's time to remove the block from the engine stand. It's got a bit of weight to it, but I can definitely lift it up with two hands. Now when they say your engine has spun a bearing, it basically means that this bearing here has heated up so much and there's no oil left that has actually come apart from the block and spun around on the crankshaft leaving a gap on the bottom here 
and that's causing the crankshaft to knock around and wear out the engine blocks. And they see the engine has a rod knock, it means that this bearing here is toast and has a little gap in it causing a knocking sound when this piston is moving up and down. Now when they say the engine's thrown a rod, it basically means that somehow this connecting rod here has become loose from this crankshaft and this crankshaft usually rotating at really high RPM ain't got no time for a loose connecting rod and it's just gonna go crush and smash that connecting rod through the block itself and make a hole. So here we have the crankshaft and we have four main points here that represent the center line of this crankshaft as it rotates in the engine block. We have the offsetted parts over here where the connecting rods attach to. Now the distance here between the connecting rod center and the crankshaft center with the force of the piston moving down is what creates the moment about the center of the crankshaft here. We've also got these huge counterweights that are situated on the opposite side of the piston and that's just to counter any of the shaking forces that come from the piston moving up and down so the engine is nice and balanced and smooth. Now here we have the cylinder head and the camshaft lobe here on this cylinder is in its furthest down position. You can see that the valve itself is all the way open and that is what will allow intake air to come in through here with the fuel. Now on top of the valve stem we also have a tappet and this tappet here provides a nice flat surface for this cam to ride up against. Now to remove one of these valves, I'm just going to put a spark plug socket on it and give it a quick tap with the hammer. And that releases the valve itself. We have this little retainer over here. We have the return spring and the valve itself and remove from the bottom. So here we have the valve itself. Now this surface along here is really important because it provides a sealing surface between the combustion chamber and the engine head. Now as we saw in the cylinder block, when the piston is at top dead center, it's pretty much flush with the top of the block here. And that basically means that these valves must be completely closed when this piston is at the top. Now if I wipe off the top of this piston here, you can see that we have these little engraved parts here where the valve itself would sit when it's at top dead center. That's how close it is. And if this valve here actually comes in contact with the piston, like if the timing belt is snapped or is off a bit, then you could have a piston valve collision causing the valves to bend or other harmful engine damage. These wipes are actually pretty good at cleaning up carbon deposits, but not that good at soaking up oil. So the next time you start your car's engine, think of all of these components that go into making it work. From the timing components over here to the accessories, the engine block, the crankshaft, the heads and the piston, and even the small little fasteners here that hold everything together. Make sure you follow me on Instagram because I'll have behind the scenes footage on what's coming up next, hint hint. And subscribe to me on YouTube if you want to see more videos just like this one. Stay tuned because next time I'm going to show you how to turn this engine into a nice TV stand.